Hey everyone, this is Brayden from the Catechumen. Now, I am a convert from the Baptist tradition. And for those of you who are acquainted with uh, Baptists, or you used to be a Baptist, or you know some Baptists, you would probably know that the Baptists are some of the most anti Catholic, typically, I won't say all Baptists, you know, Gavin Orland isn't an, an anti-Catholic per se. <laughs> the jack o lantern <laughs> the chocolate ice. <laughs> but of all the anti-Catholics on the internet and in the world, most of them, at least from my experience, have been Baptists. And now I'm defining the word anti-Catholic very loosely, meaning someone who doesn't really care to um, look into what the Catholic Church really believes, that just just wants to uh, grasp at straws, at, at trying to figure out a way to discredit the church, discredit what we believe. And uh, usually you find most of the myths about the Catholic Church in these circles. Now, I was so super big in this circle. I was wanting to discredit the Catholic Church with every uh, piece of information that I had, whether I thought it was true or not, or I researched it to see if it was true or not. Anything that I had bad on the Catholic Church, I just wanted to get out there. And I remember I had a, a friend in high school that I would constantly just you know, whenever these sorts of topics came up, I would just like bash him with all this information that I that I supposedly had about the Catholic Church. And it wasn't until I, I actually found the Catholic Catholic resources that would positively give uh, an argument for uh, a particular belief, say regenerative bapti baptism or or something of that uh, of that nature that I was able to exit my echo chamber. Now, I'm not saying that every single Baptist is in an echo chamber or every single Protestant. That's not my claim. I know a lot of really good meaning Protestants who are exposed to many sides of Protestantism, many sides of Catholicism, Orthodoxy, uh, all flavors of Christianity, and they aren't in an echo chamber. But but I got out of my echo chamber. That was my experience. Uh, whenever I looked into these arguments, looked into the history of, of the church, and obviously I think that the early church uh, was the Catholic church and that the Catholic church was established by Jesus Christ himself until I found TikTok. Now, whenever TikTok came out, uh, I did not get on TikTok. I have not really been on TikTok. I think I made a TikTok maybe a year ago to look at uh, a friend's TikTok page, but I am not a frequenter of TikTok until recently. I just now got back on TikTok. I, I made a the Catechumen TikTok page. If you guys are on TikTok and you're interested in that, I'm posting some shorts on there, and I might doing might be doing some response videos on there. But man. The, the people on TikTok are just so informed about the Catholic Church and what we believe that uh, it's really just, it's, it's given me a hard time. And I, I think it might be giving you guys a hard time as well. And I don't know, this might be the end of it. This might be the end of uh, thousands of years of, of holy saints and doctors of the church and councils. They might have just ruined it all for me, honestly. I mean, the 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 arguments on TikTok just destroy Catholicism. From, obviously, that's, that's satirical. There is a lot of nonsense on TikTok, and I think that um, most of the people who make this sort of content on TikTok, they would not listen to you if you made a informative response to them. And so the, the purpose of this specific video is to sort of show, okay, this is how much Catholicism is misrepresented in, in popular media. And uh, this, is, this is how much people don't really understand Catholicism. And had Catholicism actually been the thing that they are critiquing, obviously we shouldn't be Catholic, you know, but if, if those things were true. But obviously those things aren't. And uh, we're going to be looking at some TikTok videos. We're going to be responding to them. And, and more so, we're not trying to respond directly to these people. I know that a lot of them, uh, from my experience of, of looking at TikTok and, and responses on TikTok, I know that most of them probably wouldn't respond or reply or have a change of heart. I'm posting this video so that you guys can be exposed to uh, some peculiar arguments that you might not have heard before. Some uh, some of them might be history. Some of them might be the theology or, or uh, the, the, the Bible, uh, so that you guys can be exposed to those things and so that you guys would know how to respond if other people bring them up. Honestly, I think this might just be fun. I, I, I think that uh, looking at some of these videos 
might just be entertaining for us because of the obvious ignorance that people have about the Catholic Church. So by no means do I want to make fun of people. I don't think that is uh, a very Christ-like thing to do. Um, but when people bring up uh, arguments that aren't made from uh, research, solid research, we'll just say that, that are made out of ignorance, well, we're fine with making fun of the arguments, not the people. I don't want you to attack these people. I don't want you to be rude to these people or make fun of these people. Um, but when Catholics are so often misrepresented by uh, the people around us, our, our fellow Christian brothers and sisters in Protestantism, sometimes it's just funny to, uh, to look at the reasons why we might be <laughs> maligned, I suppose. So anyways, I hope you guys enjoy this video. Let me know if you guys want me to do some more of these and uh, let's get right into it. All right, this one looks interesting. Roman Catholicism is a fake religion and believing in it will not save you. Reasons why Catholicism is not the truth. Praying to Mary, okay. <laughs> Worshiping statues, guys, that's what we do. And salvation through works. All right, let's go ahead and dissect this. Catholicism is a fake religion uh, for, for these three reasons. I, I find it peculiar that these are the three reasons. So praying to Mary is apparently disproven uh, through 1 Timothy 2.5. Let's, let's go ahead and take a look at that. This is what the Apostle Paul says to Timothy. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Now, this is a typical verse that is brought up in uh, the discussion about intercessory prayer. Can, can people who are in heaven, uh, i.e. saints, angels, uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary, can they pray for us? Can we ask them to pray for us to God? And this verse is cited, uh, and it's, it's very interesting that it is cited, and I'm, I'm going to show you why. So it says, for there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And so they use this verse to say, look, you guys think that there are more than one mediator between God and man. You think that you're, you're putting Mary between you and God. You're putting the saints and the angels between you and God when you ask for their uh, intercession, when you ask them to pray for you. We're supposed to go directly to God because there is one mediator between God and man. And you're, you're putting all this, this whole line of people between you and God. We can go straight to God in prayer. We don't need to ask them to pray for us. And, and what's ironic about this sort of argument is it, it, it seems to prove too much, so to say. And so uh, let, let me uh, just show a little bit of the, the, the context of this passage. It's very ironic. So when you say you can't ask Mary to pray for you because there's only one mediator between God and man, we can go straight to God. You don't need to go through Mary, through the, through the angels, through the saints. Uh, what, what that also communicates, if we're being uh, consistent here, is that we don't need to ask other people to pray for us. We, we don't need to be praying for other people because they can go straight to God. And, and, and while that's true, we don't need, we don't have a necessity of going through other people, asking other people to pray for us, praying for other people. We don't have that necessity, uh, but, but scripture commands us to. Scripture commands us to pray for other people and scripture commands people to pray for you. And how do we know this? Have you guys noticed it yet on the screen? Verse one, first of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all men, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life, godly and respectful in every way. This is good, and it is acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Wow, okay, so if the idea that there is one mediator between God and man, uh, nullifies the idea of intercessory prayer, i.e., I pray for you, you pray for me, people can pray on my behalf, I can pray on other people's behalf, uh, then I guess Paul was just blowing smoke at the first part of this chapter when he says that it's good to pray for all men. It's good that prayers, supplications, and intercessions be made for all men. So then we can say that uh, the idea that there is one mediator between God and man 
doesn't negate the idea that other people can pray for you or you can ask other people to pray for you. And so what does this mean? What, what does this mean from a Catholic perspective? The meaning of this passage becomes evident in the passage itself, in the verse that directly uh, proceeds after uh, verse 5. And so it goes, there's one God, there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Oh, there's a comma there. Huh. Uh, who, okay, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony to which was given at the proper time. So what's, what's the point that's being made here? Not that only Jesus can pray for you. Obviously, other people can pray for you. Obviously, you can ask other people to pray for you. And obviously, you can pray for other people. What the, the point that's being made here is that Jesus is the unique, the only mediator of redemption. He is the only one that can bring us back together with God after we've been separated through original sin and personal sin. And so we separate ourselves, but he mediates redemption. He mediates salvation. And that's why it says he gave himself as a ransom for all. And that's why it says earlier that God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth because God, or because Christ gave himself as a ransom for all. And so this passage doesn't negate the idea that Mary or the saints can pray for us, just like it doesn't negate the idea that you can pray for me. And I, again, I do ask for your continued prayers because I think that uh, prayer is powerful. I think that God is powerful and that God can answer prayers and that things uh, will, will, will be left unhappened if they are not prayed for. The second verse that he brings up is Ecclesiastes 9, 5 through 6. And this passage is usually brought up by Seventh-day Adventists, so it's interesting to see that he brings it up. Um, and and whenever I was a Baptist and I was really trying to search out um, what I believed, I had, uh, for a moment, just like Martin Luther did, started uh, drifting into the idea of soul sleep, which is the idea that once you die, you are actually just unconscious until the time when the body is resurrected. Uh, and this is one of the uh, proof passages for that. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing, and they have no more reward, but the memory of them is lost. Their love and their hate and their envy have already perished, and they have no more forever any share in all that is done under the sun. And so the idea is that, look, since the dead know nothing, they not only can't know your prayer requests, but they just, they don't, they don't know anything. They've already perished. They're in the grave. They're dead. They're unconscious. And they're waiting for the resurrection. Now, as many of you may know, Ecclesiastes is a extremely, an extremely uh, pessimistic uh, wisdom book of scripture. And so, so it communicates from these different perspectives about uh, the futility of certain activities in life. It's very here and now centered. It's not really centered on uh, life afterwards. And so that's why it has a very pessimistic view of those who die. He says to, you know, enjoy life while you can. And, and a little bit later, he says, enjoy life with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life, which he has given you under the sun, because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil at under the sun. And so what he's communicating here isn't annihilationism. This is from the perspective of the temporal. This is not the eternal perspective. And and we can contrast this pessimism in Ecclesiastes uh, with the words of Christ to the Sadducees who actually didn't believe in the resurrection. Now, uh, I won't go into Ecclesiastes to show how there are hints and, and, and glimpses of the idea of resurrection and reward and, and, and things like that uh, after death. I won't go into that because that'll take a long time. It is there. Um, but Let's go to the words of Christ to get a fuller picture. So the Sadducees were a first century Jewish sect uh, who only believed in the first five books of Moses. And if you look in the first five books of Moses, uh, the, the idea of uh, resurrection or of a post-mortem judgment is very implicit, and it's only illuminated uh, in, in the later uh, books of Scripture, especially in the exile and post-exilic time period. And, and so like Daniel and Isaiah and, and those, those sorts of prophetic books, those are the first times that we see explicitly the idea of the resurrection of the dead. And so the reason, and so the Sadducees, 
And so the Sadducees didn't believe in the bodily resurrection or the afterlife or angels because they had only accepted the first five books of Scripture and they and they interpreted uh, some of those passages differently than the Pharisees would or the Essenes would or the Zealots would and so on. And so uh, the, the Sadducees come to Jesus and ask him a question trying to catch him in some weird logic about uh, marriage and wives and such. But Jesus says in response to them that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now, he is not God of the dead, but God of the living, for all live to him. And his point is, Moses didn't write that uh, God is uh, was the God of Abraham and was the God of Isaac and was the God of Jacob. The point is that God is currently the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so these saints, and so these holy people who lived of old, are alive to God. And so taking the knowledge from that passage that uh, these saints are alive to God, let's look at Hebrews chapters 11 and 12. So it goes into the uh, examples of sanctity that are present in the Old Testament and all throughout salvation history up until this time period. And so the author of Hebrews uh, talks about Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, and just talking about the wonderful things that they did, about how righteous and obedient and faithful that these people are, and going on, going on, talking about Moses and people Uh, in Israel's history, but notice the very beginning of chapter 12, after he's talked about all these saintly um, witnesses to God's goodness, uh, who, who are obedient, who are faithful, what does he say in the beginning of chapter 12 in his exhortation to Christians of to, to live faithfully? Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin, which clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. So after he has gone this entire chapter of of pointing out people in the Old Testament who who were saintly, casting aside sin and being obedient to God, he says, therefore, which logically follows from from what has been said before, therefore, since we are surrounded by so a great cloud of witnesses, these people that he just described are witnesses of our race. They, they are, by their example, and, and, and as we'll show a little bit later, by their prayers, encouraging us and helping us continue in perseverance, continue to, to lay aside sin. And this is very important. The people who have gone before are witnesses of what's happening right here, right now in our lives. And so this theme finally culminates in the heavenly vision that John has in the book of Revelation. There are 24 elders, 24 saints who are in heaven worshiping Jesus, who's who's called the Lamb in this passage. And these saints have golden bowls of incense that they're offering to Jesus. And what does it say in, in at the end of verse 8? Golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Okay, so they're they're offering what to Jesus? What what are they offering? What what are they incensing? They're offering the prayers of the saints. And this isn't the only time that this happens in the book of Revelation. It's not just the elders, not just the saints who have gone before us. It's also the angels. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, an incenser, and he was given much incense to mingle with what? What is he mingling the incense with that he's offering to God as worship? the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense rose with the prayers of the saints from the hand of the angel before God. The angels, the saints, those who have gone before us in the faith and who have who've been faithful and perseverant in the faith, they're not only alive to God, and they're, they're not only witnessing this race that we, we as Christians are running before us that they have already completed, but they're also aware of our prayers and able to offer our prayers as worship to Jesus, to God the Father in heaven. They're able to do that. They're they're, they're able to be aware somehow of our prayers, as is evident from Revelation. They're obviously able to witness our race, as is evident from Hebrews 11 and 12. And they're able to aid us by those prayers. I spent a little bit too much time uh, going through that logic for you guys, but all that to say... These two passages don't say much about intercessory prayer in the New Covenant. 
<laughs> and this is the part that I thought was funny. Worshiping statues, Catholics don't worship anything, anyone but God alone. Worship belongs to God alone. We can't, we cannot worship anything, anyone besides God. And so, uh, worshiping statues, we're with you on that. We 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 have those passages in our our Bible as well. So we are a hundred percent with you on that. This shit. And salvation through works. Again, this is just a caricature of what Catholics actually believe. Do we believe that we can earn forgiveness of our sins? Do we believe that uh, before we've received justification that we can somehow earn that? We can't earn the grace of initial justification. We, we can't earn uh, being transferred from a state of sin and death and separation from God uh, to uh, being children of God, being righteous in his, in his sight. We can't earn that. We can't deserve that. There's nothing that we can do to affect that on our own. We need grace. And, and so this, this whole concept about Catholics believe that they can earn their salvation and, and all, all this stuff, it is not true. It is not true. And uh, there, there's a conversation that can be had, again, about merit, about an increase of justification. But all of that is, is completely impossible apart from God's grace. Everything good about us is not from us. It is a gift uh, received directly from God. And all we have to do is accept that. All we have to do is accept that, right? We can't increase in justification. We can't persevere. We can't even receive the initial act of justification apart from grace. And the initial act of justification is completely apart from anything that we do. It is, it is sheer grace, by grace, through faith, apart from anything that we do, apart from any works, that initial act of God justifying us, of making us a, 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 a saint from a sinner is completely gratuitous. It's not, it's not anything that we do. And even, uh, I, I might say, whenever we fall from grace, whenever we lose the grace of justification, there's nothing that we can do to earn that back. We are sinners. We, we, we've separated ourselves from God. And the only thing that we can do is receive his grace again. The only thing that we can do is receive a supernatural working of God's mercy to the sacrament of reconciliation. We can't earn that. There's nothing that we can do to merit that. And so uh, my Protestant brothers and sisters, when we talk about an increase of justification, an increase of justice, it's the same thing as if, oh, practically the same thing, as if you were to say that, uh, as my Lutheran friend said, uh, sanctification is is our cooperation with God's grace, wherein we can grow or decrease in sanctity through sin or through obedience. As Catholics, we just hold to the historic Christian position that justification isn't just a legal declaration that has no bearing within you as a creature. We believe that God declares that we're righteous and actually makes us righteous. He, he destroys sin. He doesn't just cover up sin. He doesn't just cover up this pile of dung with snow. He actually inwardly makes us righteous. We are actually righteous in that moment when he justifies us. And, and this righteousness isn't an alien righteousness. It's not outside of us. He creates within us a new heart so that we are able to follow his commandments. This righteousness is from God, but it's also ours. It's also something that we can affect by our actions. All right, we've spent enough time on that one. <laughs> All right, reasons why Catholicism is false. The Bible teaches us to confess our sins to God, and for God only can forgive your sins. Isaiah 43, Luke 5, verse 24. The Roman Catholic Church says that you must confess your sins to the priest for forgiveness. All right, Catholicism is false because we confess our sins to one another and God forgives us through confession. Wait a minute, that sounds awfully familiar. 1 John 1, 9, if, so it's contingent upon this action, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so they will say, okay, well, yeah, we believe that if you confess your sins, but you, you, you don't confess your sins to, to people. You, you, that's not how you get forgiven. You confess your sins to God and he forgives you that way. And, and while we don't deny that God can and often does forgive sins apart from the sacrament of reconciliation, what is the intended context for receiving forgiveness of sins that Jesus established in John chapter 20? I'm curious. Jesus said to them, his apostles, Peace be with you. 
As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive, wait a second, you? Who, who's you there? The, the disciples, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. So while I agree, our, our sin is against an eternally, infinitely holy God. Our, our sins are against him. And him alone do we sin against. Now, obviously, we, we offend other people. We, we offend ourselves when we sin. There, there's that sort of uh, effect that it has on, on people. But the eternal guilt of sin is against God. He alone can decide when you're forgiven, how you're forgiven. He alone can, can, can do that. But friends, is Jesus God? Of course, Jesus is God. And, and Wait a second. Earlier we said that God can forgive sins whenever and however he wants. And so then it follows that, yes, God alone forgives sins, but can God not impart the authority to forgive sins to human ministers as he does in John chapter 20? Can God, does, does God not have the authority to do that? If God can forgive sins whenever, however he wants, using whoever he wants, can he not do that? That must be why it says in James 5, 16, confess your sins to one another, not to God alone, to one another. It's not like in the sacrament of reconciliation, the, the priest is just forgiving your sins because you sinned against him alone, or he actually has the inherent authority to do that. No, it is God who is forgiving you through the priest as an instrument. Just like the water doesn't save you in baptism, it's God who saves you using baptism instrumentally to save you. In any of the sacraments, in any of the miracles, it's not the, the object or the instrument that is doing the, 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 the effect, that is giving off the effect. It's, it's really God and what God intends to do. And so if he intends to forgive you through his instituted ministers, his sacramental ministers, He's free to do that. Could you elaborate more about Catholicism? Yeah, it's just another false religion like any other, but when I say that, I'm specifically <sighs> talking about the official position of the Catholic Church. I'm not talking okay. about all Catholics, because the official position. God, not all Catholics believe in what the Catholic Church teaches. Now, okay. we see in the Bible. So, so what does the Catholic Church teach? I'm ready for this. I don't know why I saved this. Again, I saved all these videos a long time ago, like over a month ago, so we'll, we'll see. We'll see if... Uh, yeah, we'll see if he actually gets this right. Salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus as a gift Amen. from God. It has yep. nothing to do with works, okay? After which necessary sanctification comes, okay? Okay, okay. So catch that. The, the, the folly of many Protestants is, is the idea that salvation is a one-time event that's experienced in the past. Are you saved? Were you saved? Never we are being saved. Now, that's not all Protestants, again. But, but this group just, just has this fascination of the idea that, uh, that there's a one-time event, which we, we believe, but the one-time event is the only event. As Catholics, we affirm the words of Scripture that says that we are being saved. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 15, for we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved. And so we recognize this threefold sense of salvation in Scripture, the idea that we were saved in the past. God, God initially justified us. That's, that's the initial moment of justification that we receive in baptism by grace through faith. But we are also being saved. And, and, and he mentioned in Ephesians 2.10 that we are saved to produce good works. And so our good works don't precede that salvation, that initial moment of salvation, but they ought to necessarily follow from that because God has infused his justice within us. And so that process that Protestants reduce to uh, the, the title of sanctification, uh, we realize that that is a part of our salvation. The present experience of salvation that can be lost, that can be affected, that, that sanctification, that process of sanctification or process of justification is a part of salvation. It's a part of how God is saving us in the here and now with practical effects. And that's why Paul can say, we are being saved. We were saved, we're being saved, and in the future, we will be saved. We will be saved. There's a part of salvation that we actually haven't fully received yet, that, that we haven't uh, gone to, to be with heaven with, with Christ.
And so, yeah, this video says uh, Catholicism denies salvation as a gift. That is absolutely false. That's false. Uh, we, we, every part of our salvation is a gift. Every single bit of it. We can do nothing apart from Christ. We can do nothing good apart from his grace. A grace through faith as a gift for free has nothing to do with what you've done in your entire life. Then necessary sanctification comes next. Okay. This is why faith without works is dead. Every James 2, 14 through 26. Huh. That's, that's interesting that he quotes that. James 2, 24 is included in there. You see that a man is justified by... What does that say? Justified by works and not by faith alone. You see, a lot of people think that the debate is, is surrounding uh, whether faith is alive or dead. James 2, 20, faith apart from works is dead or barren. A lot of people think that's where the debate lies, but that's not where the debate lies. The debate lies in James 2, 24. Man is justified by, instrumentally, by works and not by faith alone. Everyone who is saved is going to walk in the light of life. And there's also this perspective to those who hold to the automatic perseverance of the saints, the idea that once you're initially saved, you, you can't lose your salvation no matter what, that you will automatically produce good fruit. And while uh, as Catholics, we affirm that good fruit is a natural uh, product of your faith, of, of being attached to Christ, It'll just look at John chapter 15, it's not an automatic thing. It's not something that we sit back and wait for, and that, that's that's a caricature. It's it's not something that true believers will inevitably do. I just, that that's not scriptural. That's, that's not supported by any passage. That is Jesus Christ. Of course, the Catholic Church denies this because they actually <laughs> mix the good works that people do with salvation. They say you have to cooperate with God in order to receive grace. But of course, Romans 11, chapter 6 says, if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. Could you laugh? <laughs> Okay, so we, we don't deny the, the fact that uh, salvation is a gift. We, we don't deny the fact that no works preceding salvation can earn salvation, can earn forgiveness, can earn God's mercy. You, you, you can't do that. Uh, what, what he doesn't understand is the present experience of salvation, sanctification, the process of becoming more holy, more just, whatever you want to call it, that present experience, that process is by cooperation with God. It is. That's why Paul says this to Titus. I desire you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful, may be careful to apply themselves to good deeds. Wait a second. We have to be careful to apply, our, us believers, we have to be careful to apply ourselves to good deeds. I thought that good deeds come inevitably after you have faith. I thought that that's just an automatic response. Now, the desire to do good is, is obviously a result from God's grace, a result of believing in, in what the scriptures say and believing God's testimony, but it, it's not something that happens to you. It's something that you have to be careful to do. Well, I don't know when my camera uh, ran out of recording space, but uh, I guess there was a black point in that video for a second. And the last passage that I'll point to before getting off here is Philippians 2.12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For God is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This perfectly coincides with the Catholic position, okay? We need to work out our salvation, but it's God who is enabling you. If, if God didn't give you the ability to work out your salvation, to, to grow in justice, to grow in goodness and good fruit, you wouldn't be able to do it. The, 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 the ability comes from being attached to Christ, receiving his grace, and that's why sacramental theology is so important. But it, it is God who is doing those things within you. That is why they are good and pleasing to his eyes. You know, people often want to cite that passage from Isaiah talking about how our, our works are a dirty rag. It's like a menstrual cloth to God. He doesn't want any of our, any of our works because they're just dirty and polluted and disgusting to him. Uh, now, I want to point out that that passage is addressed to Israel who was 
uh, trying to appease God, not by being faithful to his commandments, not by uh, having a pure heart in mind, uh, but by continuing in impurity while trying to appease his wrath through uh, festivals and ceremonial laws. God doesn't want your religious acts of obedience to rituals, even though they might be good in some circumstances. You know, those things were instituted by God for our benefit. Uh, if you are not having love, if you're not um, showing charity to the poor, to those who are um, oppressed. But look at how Revelation describes the uh, good works of the saints. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Uh, who's the bride? It's, it's the church. The church is the bride in, in Revelation. For it was granted her to be clothed with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is what? What is the fine linen that the church is wearing to the to the marriage of the lamb? The righteous deeds of the saints. So while uh, Israel's uh, deeds were a, a filthy rag, that's comparable and contrasted with the righteous deeds of the saints, which is a fine linen, bright and pure. These things are impossible to do, impossible to have, to perform apart from God's grace. It's God's grace who purifies us and who enables us to do good works that are that are pure, who, that are righteous in His sight, uh, because he, have ju- he has justified us and enabled us to do those things. And so, um, final final words of wisdom: Catholics don't believe that we can earn forgiveness, earn salvation. We don't believe that anything preceding. Uh, that initial moment of justification, when we when we receive justice uh, as a state of a in the state of a sinner, we receive justice, we receive forgiveness. God abolishes all of our sin, and we become righteous. Nothing that precedes that can ever merit salvation, um, can ever deserve that. But when God gives us His grace, when God infuses justice in us. We become just, and we can grow in that, and we can uh, we can have these righteous deeds that God looks upon and says, "Wow, well done." And, and so uh, that's why Jesus says that only those who do the will of the Father will inherit the kingdom of heaven. In Matthew seven, not everyone who says "Lord, Lord," but only those who do the will of the Father. So uh, yeah, Catholics don't believe in workspace righteousness. Uh, Catholics don't worship statues. That's a weird claim, and. Uh, you can ask people to pray for you. Uh, believe it or not, we can we can actually ask uh, other Christians to pray for us. It just so happens that uh, we have a great cloud of witnesses that are that, that's here to uh, aid us with their prayers uh, because the prayer of the righteous man availeth much. Anyways, that's uh, long enough for me. I hope that by my learning the faith, your faith will be strengthened as well. You have an amazing day, and we'll see you guys next time.